Are your dice writing checks your characters can't cash? They pull a splat book, you pull an evasion. They send one of yours to the temple, you send one of theirs to the crypt. That's the Gaming and BS way. Tune in to Gaming and BS for entertainment, role-playing, discussion, and zip-zaps. It's better to burn out than to fade away. On the razor's edge. Fantastic! Welcome to Gaming and BS, a tabletop RPG podcast. This is episode 162, coming to you Tuesday, October 24th. I'm on your host, Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome back to the show. Welcome aboard if you're new. So who was that at the beginning, man? Was that the That's goblin? Blake. Was that Blake? Okay. Couldn't tell if that was Blake. Blake. Couldn't tell if that was Blake or the henchman. Yeah, he sent uh, he sent two in, nice. so he in, did one last week and this week. Nice. <sighs> so how you doing, man? Oh, smashing, man, smashing. I'm freaking exhausted. You're exhausted. <clears throat> yeah, I did the. I did. I, I mentioned this on Twitter. If uh, if you know how to do it, you can change the light bulbs in my truck in like five minutes a piece. But if you don't know how to do it, it's three hours. Just saying. I guess you doesn't know what the fuck three, he's doing. That'd be this three guy. Three hours. Yeah. That was tiring. Not a not a uh whatever certified mechanic. No, no, not at all. I have soft little typist hands. <laughs> I mean yeah, that's not that's not good. Anyway, got that done. Then I had a, I had a decent gaming weekend. I played D and D Friday. Um buddy of mine is running some of that. Alpha's running up in my hometown. Then I kicked off my Warhammer campaign on Saturday. We started at noon and went till about ten, I think. So it was pretty good. What'd you it's do? Fantastic. Did you do any gaming this weekend? Uh no. No, no gaming this weekend. I let Saturdays float me by. Saturday's kind of my I'm really freaking tired from the weekday. From the week. We are day. older than me and you do need more. You do need more rest. You do. So, yeah, I do quite a bit of resting on Saturday. I can see that. And then I uh, I broke out the rules cyclopedia. Oh, wow. Okay. I just looked it over because I don't think I've ever looked it over at all. And Dan Dome. Yes. Uh, gave me a copy at Gary Con this past year. So I thought I'd look at that just a little bit. It has a ton of stuff in it. Like if you want to have a you want to have a siege warfare, it's got rules for siege warfare. I mean, it's got rules for everything in it. Well, I think I I think I was intrigued because online I saw just this discussion about it being very good and people loving it, and it's the kind of the rule book to rule them all, or the version. Huh. I don't know a version, but. Just the organization, and it's really good, and it beats kind of all its predecessors, even though a lot of it's based on some of the predecessors. And I'm like, you know, I don't think I've ever looked at that stupid thing. So I busted it out and started paging through it. Were you impressed? I didn't get very far, but, yeah, I got to, like, Thacko. Ugh. Yeah, because you can't, you, you just don't like having a chart to look at. It upsets your modern sensibilities. No. Uh, just man, it's just the most asinine thing that I think ever came out of D and D, except for maybe grappling, and that's a that that may be tied. It just doesn't make sense to me, man. Okay, here's the deal: Ro- hit, rolling to hit doesn't make sense, Sean. Rolling to hit for a flurry of combat blows, and they say, "Did you hit him?" Well, yeah. Are you hit? I missed the whole rolling to hit thing. Is odd. Well, I think you have to have it in some aspect or another if you're in a combat kind of deal. But going, hey, I have armor. It's going to give you an AC. And, oh, by the way, zero is better than three. That's just too hard, for you. That's just roll, too hard for you to get. That's just too <laughs> much. Roll, it's too much. God. If I read the fucking rule out of that book... If to a new person, they'd be like, uh, derp. And I don't blame them. Well, I'd be like, get the fuck out. You're too stupid to play my game. Get out. Whoa. Hey, <laughs> Brett's taking new gamers. 
<laughs> Brett, the Brett representing the uh, the RPG hobby, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, that's... newcomers welcome. Yeah, exactly. Do you, can you understand this? Not really. Get out. Yeah, that's what I do. Anyway, cool. We, yeah, you know, cool. We, what we should do is I don't think we might maybe one of these days we'll go back and crack out one of those older books like that, older rule sets, and just kind of go through it, talk about it on the show. Might be fun. We haven't done that. In a yeah, while. that would. Yeah, that would be fun. Sure. All right. So we might as well get rolling here before we wax just into total maudlin weirdness here. Um, from the announcements pool, we do have Evercon coming up. Again, evercon.org. Submissions are open. we got Alex Kammer coming down. He's going to run some stuff for us. We have Samantha Gorell as another special guest. She does a lot of uh, art. Um, great artist and comic book author. She'll be in the house as well. Don't have a ton of special guests this year, but we're keeping it kind of small, intimate in that space. Should have a lot of good gaming and all that good stuff. I know Corey Wynn, I think Dave Wynn, and a few other folks from his tribe are going to make their way to the con, so that'll be cool. <laughs> Hoping I can get... Uh, well, I know my gaming group in my hometown, because it's the hometown con for us, will be there in force, and hopefully other folks will be able to make it up there as well. Maybe even Sean. You never know. Start the new year off. Get it's, you on my, con. It's, on my to, it's on my to-do list. Hopefully... Uh... I think at the I think I think our CTO isn't a crude. I think it, it's just like you have it. So January first, I may be out of the freaking hole. You might be flush with time off. You don't even know what to do with it all. <laughs> crazy, crazy time. Oh, and by the way, there's another convention coming up like right fucking soon, and that's called Game Hole Con. So hey, um, if you're gonna show up, I hope you do. And uh, always, though, be more than happy to sell you a badge at the door. Um, let's see, Sean, we've got the, the gaming BS Uber. Are you still doing that or what are you thinking? I, I will do the gaming and BS Uber, uh, Thursday, Thursday evening. I have to work half a day Thursday. Uh, I am in the hole for CTO or PTO, however you want to pay time off. So, um, if you come in before one o'clock on Thursday, I will not be able to, accommodate your schedule into uh, MSN airport. Um, but afterwards, potentially, yeah. Kind of, but you got to give me a heads up. What kind of free service you offering, man? I want my money back already. It, it's, <laughs> it's all terms and conditions apply. Exactly. <laughs> read, the, read, read the bottom of the beer can. You'll understand what we're talking about. That's right. Ah, anyway, so hopefully oh, folks will be coming so f- to a game hall. We can see people there. Yes, Friday, I, I still want to do a beer exchange Friday night. So mm-hmm. this is just word of mouth. If you happen to get a six-pack of beer, um, we're going to do it in the Comfort Inn. They don't care. Um, we'll just do it in the lounge. We'll Comfort Inn or Clarion? Comfort Inn or Clarion? God damn it. The Clarion. The Clarion. Which is the actually Clarion, attached Clarion. Which is attached to the convention center, so you can walk right over to it. That's where you're staying, right, Brad? No, not this year. That was It was full up before I got there. But I got Where are you staying? Um, I actually think it is the comfort him a little bit down the road, so I'll be fine. Okay. Clarion Lounge, connected to the Alliant Energy Center. We will have a beer exchange Friday night. Drink responsibly. Must be 21 to participate. Exactly, and then free beer on Saturday. And then free beer on Saturday, yep. Oh, and we're going to have a guest, I think, join us at Game Hole Con. Aside from everybody else, we're going to have Rob, I think, Rob on the show. Oh, Rob Wheeland? Yeah. Oh, that'll be nice. That'll be really cool. So Rob, Rob's a cool Rob's dude. Gonna, Rob's a very cool Rob's gonna. Rob's going to be on the show at some point. I, and I say, hey, Rob, you want to pimp some stuff? And he's like, nah, I don't need to. So we could probably talk a little bit about Rob, talk a little bit about the industry, talk a little bit about the con. So we'll have... A third party on the show. Maybe somebody else. Who knows? We got plenty of uh, who's who well, we've, coming. We've got the recording gear there. We'll be grabbing different um, seminars, as, as always. We'll grab the Watsi seminar where we can. We might be able to get uh, some traveler stuff going because I think uh, the man himself, Mr. Mark Miller, will be there. We've got uh, plenty of opportunities to grab different con special guests um, to grab their panels and such. And hopefully we'll get some other things going, too. So Cool. Very cool. I like Rob. Rob's an awesome guy. Yeah, so if you don't know who Rob is, he has done um, Atomic Robo, I believe, is one of his uh, productions. 
And I think, or yeah, let's see. So he is. He's written for a lot of different uh, White Wolf, um, all that good stuff. He's done a lot of good stuff. Yes. Yeah. Uh, shoot. I thought it was Atom- was it Atomic Robo? I think so. But yeah, he, we're going to have him on the show. He's done. He's writing for um, Geek and Sundry, does articles on there. Um, what else? He's got a lot of RPG credits under his belt that he's written for for third parties. Yeah, he's just a cool. And and when you get to hang out with Rob, he's just fun. He's a good dude. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Let's get into a random encounter. And do that. All right. Random encounter. Let's see. You want to start, Brett? <sighs> okay. Let's see here. Episode 162. We've got some feedback here. Let's see. Jason posted up <clears throat> and says, hey, great episode. Brett? Oh. Oh, there's more to it than that. I see. Oh, Brett, comma, I'm intrigued by the way you described the structure of your gaming sessions. It sounds as if you're going to have a separate story thread for each of your eight PCs in order to avoid forcing them into a group. <clears throat> While admirable, I'm wondering how you maintain table engagement if your gaming night essentially consists of a series of one-to-one sessions with only occasional points of cohesion that may not involve the whole group. Do you handle the separate stories away from the table via email? Do your players engage in other activities while you're working with someone else? Or is your group so disciplined and focused that they patiently... (laughs) Disciplined and focused. You got me there. Um, That they patiently wait their turn as you work through each person's story. Maybe I missed something in your description of a typical session. I know you covered something like this in a previous episode, but I'd love to hear how you manage player engagement in this particular setup, especially with so many players. I gave a larger group, six players, and I found that um, that comes at a cost of individual character development. I'd love any advice on bringing that piece back without paring down the group size. Thank and keep up the awesome podcast. <clears throat> well, Jason, I've got this down in the uh, diary section. What I'm going to do is I have a Google Plus community that I've built. Instead of just thrusting it and making people from the gaming BS community like automatically attached to it, if you're interested in it, um, I'm going to track... Uh, basically it's kind of a behind the scenes GM notes on what's going on and kind of how things are rolling. So if you're interested in that, let me know, uh, email us at gamingbs at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter or anywhere in the communities and uh, I'll add you to it. But short version is I actually had two guys have to, um, step out because their, their schedules aren't allowing it. So I'm down to, let's see, Alpha, Beta, Zave, JR, Nick, uh, five. I'm down to five. What? He just like the names. <laughs> I got one real name in there and a bunch of nicknames. So I'm down to just five, which is kind of, which is small for me, but it actually uh, turned out pretty well. I initially did have eight people who were going to play, but I, again, as I said, I had uh, three. Sorry, I couldn't do math earlier. Three people had to bail. They just could could not make the uh, the gaming session. But um, in short, what happened was they each have enough bits and pieces going, and then I draw. Well, one person is walking across Quinellis, the city, to go look into their thing. They then cross paths with another person who's looking into their other private uh, thing. They have an encounter together. A thing occurs, and then they have the opportunity to buddy up, which then Spiderwebby draws everybody back together so they have opportunities to meet and engage with the other player characters. They're not required to <clears throat> excuse me, form bonds or friendship with everybody, but at least they have the opportunity to see that character, get introduced in some way, and know who they are. So that way, I've described it this way. Some, the player characters are oftentimes NPC, important NPCs to the other player characters until they get to know them and form bonds of friendship of some sort with them. So I'm going to put more details in that G plus community. So if that's something you're interested in, Jason, let me know. And I'll add you to it. Sean, over to you. Thanks for writing in, Jason. We have a, a list, a friend that has called into the, the big dice line. As I cue that up, here we go. Good day, good evening, or good night, as appropriate. It is one of your faithful listeners, Stefan Dragonspawn. Um, I wish you well, you sexy BSers. I've been listening to your backlog of uh, calls, of uh, sorry, shows, uh, following your advice of starting at one and moving forward. 
I am now up to uh, number 93, and uh, I don't have a particular question or comment, but I, uh, some of the recent ones have really helped me, helped me maybe uh, do some changes, uh, do things a little differently when I GM. And I was particularly impressed with uh, interpreting die rolls, not just going, oh, this is a 1 and a 7 next to it. It must be a 17. But uh, adapting a little bit of the fancy flight game Star Wars system of gaining advantages, even if uh, you fail, maybe you gain a benefit somehow, or perhaps even if you, when you succeed, you, you allow maybe someone else, one of your allies, to uh, gain a, a bonus. I will, I will be trying to apply this to my next Savage World game. I'm running a Shintar story arc, and I hope to uh, to gain uh, maybe some, uh, some well, encourage my players at least to, uh, to try different things and be more involved in the narrative. Sorry about the rambling. Um, I didn't take any notes before this call. So anyway, great shows. Um, I love your uh, podcast, and you guys have great chemistry together. Hopefully uh, I'll get to meet Sean eventually, maybe on another con. Brett, maybe we'll meet again. All right? Bye. Well, cool. Thank you, Stefan. I am planning to go to Origins again next year. So, Stefan, if you're going or anybody else is going to Origins next year, hopefully we can be there. I'm going to see maybe if I get lucky and drag Sean to one of those. Or if we could get really lucky and get Stefan to come down for the Great White North of Canada and uh, come to Gamehole one year, that'd be pretty cool. That would be super cool. <clears throat> I do think Savage Worlds, the way with the exploding dice and acing and so forth, you probably would have that opportunity to, if you do ace, you could do something with the, hey, I've aced. I'd like to, instead of like having my dice explode, perhaps you know pass it on to an advantage to somebody else. I'm, I'm not overly familiar with all these Savage Worlds rules. Sean knows them a little bit better than I do, but I think that system would uh, work really well with kind of that type of thing you're gunning for their stuff. And so I hope that works out for you. That sounds like it would be pretty damn cool. Thank you for calling, man. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. He's supported the show all this time, and who who knew he wasn't listening? Maybe that's the key. Maybe that's the key, finally. <laughs> <laughs> finally, he got all the way back. Just He's he's been paying us to, to not podcast. <laughs> could well be. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan is good people. As I said before, I met him uh, in person at Origins with Eric Lamoureux, and uh, the three of us had a blast. They're uh, he's they're just good people. They're a lot of just great gamers all around. Cool. Uh, Next up, thanks thanks for calling in, Stefan. Yeah. You, Next up, you got to read this one. You just all you did was hit play last time. It didn't even work. William Arnold, considering trying something new with my gaming group, we've been trying to meet twice a month for roughly four sessions. In reality, we normally only meet once per month, and even that feels like pulling teeth to arrange some arrange some times. We're going to try playing on Roll20 once per week instead, but only for two hours at a time. The idea is that a two-hour block is a minimal enough commitment with no travel time that it will be doable for everyone in the group most weeks. What do, what do you guys think? Anybody ever try doing sessions that are that short? I know it's hard to accomplish much in that amount of time, but my thinking is that the regular regularity of meeting every week will establish a sense of flow that has proven difficult to attain with our current schedule. Uh, <sighs> so I I was just listening to Happy Jacks. Shout out to Stu and uh, the gang there. And they were mentioning, like, you know... Sometimes home game or home games when you're at like doing the remote virtual tabletop thing, there isn't any in the, or there, the investment is relatively low. So I think he was talking about like, yeah, you know, if I flake, it's not like everybody's put out, right? Because they're already home, they didn't drive anywhere. Oh, I see. So if my if I physically don't have to get my ass in the car, drive three hours north to the crew. There's a larger like, like, personal investment in that versus, ah, I can't make it, I'm doing laundry or something. Right. Like, the guiltiness behind it is not as bad because you're, I am, by not going out, by not joining Brett's Roll20 game, for whatever reason, 
is not putting anybody out, which is, it, it's not the truth, but it's not everybody drove to a location, set time aside. I mean, they set time aside, but not in the same principle, like same context. Um, Similar thing where it's easier uh, having, to break up with somebody over text than it is in fa- in person type of thing, right? Like, sorry, this isn't working out. Send. We can't shoot the other people. Send. Versus, hey, um, hi, Sean. I think we should find other podcasters. You know, tell, tell each other that, which is why we record distance, because it's just so much harder for Sean to break up with me this way. That's right. Now, that is not what William is getting. No, it is not. He's talking strictly on, on, on length, session length. Um, I, I mean, we do two and a half hours. Like when I, when we were running, I think Brett, we would, right? I, Star Wars games, we were starting at like seven and going to like nine thirty. Yeah. Seven to 10, you know, three hours type of thing. Maybe four. I think if you say at least it's a two hour block, depending when you start, um, I think what you may find, at least if it's the type of people I'm used to gaming with, even when Sean and I were doing stuff online with Star Wars and Trailer Cthulhu. Three hours would sometimes stretch into four, and that was fine because everyone was online. You're grooving. Hey, can we stay? We're running kind of close to time. You guys want to keep going? No, no, we're into it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go a little bit longer. That didn't hurt. So telling people a minimum of two versus only two, right? That's kind of the block. Now, the other thing I would say is that depending how by the rules, you know, rules as written, the RAR approach that you're doing and what you've got going on that evening, because if you have... Even a D&D 5e game, which is not rules for a combat, right? A small combat is not not is not necessarily going to take all two hours. But you could get a high-level D&D 5e game that could take quite some time with a big pitch combat with a lich or demons and multiple powerful things or dragons or whatnot. And then you take a game like Rollmaster um, with a large combat there can make even a big path, Pathfinder pitch battle seem incredibly, like, you know... Usain Bolt sprinting speeds. So my only thought is that make sure the rule system you've got and how you're playing it is conducive to a two-hour session. Or if you do stop and say, well, whew, we're right at the cusp of this big brawl. Next session, I think we're going to have to go three hours just so we can make sure we get through this combat. Everyone will probably go, ah, yes, yes, you're right, Sean. Or, hey, you know, you're right, William. That's what we're going to do. Obviously, we'll show up a little bit earlier. We'll game later for next time. So that's the only thing I could think of off the top of my head that would be potentially a showstopper, right? Is if you've got a big thing mechanical-wise that you can't get through in only two hours just because of the nature of the of playing the system. Yeah, no, I think, right, you got a four-hour combat and you only have a two-hour block, you're going to have to break it up or not have four-hour combats. And if you plan those two-hour chunks like you do a two-hour con session, right, um, and that's where, I think we've talked about this before, where sometimes your con game where you run a one-shot for like two hours, but then if you're on a series of one-shots that are tied with that two-hour incremental build. So I think it could work, man. I really, William, I really think you could pull this off. Two key pieces are make sure everybody understands the system, that's smooth, everybody understands what will happen. And two, I would I would hedge towards the, look, it's two-hour minimum. We might go a little bit longer. I'll try to keep it to two hours, but if we go two and a half, maybe three is anyone going to panic and uh, see how you go? I'll be interested to see how it works. And if anybody yeah. else has had experience with this, I don't know what people do online. I'm used to sitting down thinking four hours at least. Um, but if other people are gaming online a lot more, I know Ange games a lot more online than I do. So I don't know if um, Ange's games are two-hour, six-hour, eight-hour marathons. I have no idea. So I'm kind of curious whether well, people are gaming online. Hobbs does this all the freaking time. So Hobbs, man. How long are your online gaming sessions on average? I'd be interested to hear. Yeah, we're going to talk a little. Our what we're topic is today may touch on this a little bit, but my, one of the things I wanted to chime in, we'll move on to the next thing. Is I just hope that the solution that you're coming up with, William, is a solution to a, a problem, and not just trying to put a band aid on a problem that you can't fix, which is the people not showing up or not being able to commit or scheduling. Yeah, you got a pack of flaky fuckers. So, it doesn't, at some point, they'll flake on you if you if you game for 15 minutes. <laughs> so somebody will find yeah, a reason, just, you know. Just not a priority for them. It doesn't really matter how short or how infrequent you're going to pl- you're gonna try to play. Like, one hour a month. I mean, people may not show up. It's 
So hopefully it will happen. I think it's totally doable. Two hour block every week. That's still that's good. I think. Anyways. I think it's totally doable. Interested to see what happens, and of course, what other people think. If other people out there are like, "Oh, for Christ's sake, William, never do two-hour blocks." Ball. If we've got a strong feeling one way or the other, and I, as I know our listeners do on various things, uh, feel free to share it. We'll uh, share it back, with William. All right. Next up is uh, Tony Baker on G Plus says, "I know you've discussed planning for individual sessions, but how do you approach campaign planning? Take a concept from theory uh, to session zero to session twenty. Good point, Tony. I am." Um, I've talked a little bit about that, and I hinted a little bit at a, about, I shouldn't say hinted, I talked as quick as I could through the last episode 161 about my Warhammer campaign, how I'm doing it. So, you know, I think as I kind of diary myself through this one and look at my notes a little bit more, making it public to those who want to watch it, I think this may be a topic, Tony, that I, that we'll come back to after we go through that, because I'm not going to do anything special or different this time through. I think with Sean looking to kick off a new campaign as well, it'll be interesting to see kind of how you... Sometimes this stuff is is a, a deal where, I think Sean would agree with me on this, is where you, you kind of come from... It, you always run a game like X. I just kind of intrinsically know how to go from theory to session zero to session ending, whatever that is. And sometimes I know... Sean and I have talked about this before, which is why I think you'd agree with me, is that sometimes that stuff is just like built into your head. You've been doing it for so damn long. And uh, and it's that discussion of how the hell do I bottle that lightning so somebody else can figure out how I'm doing it. So interesting thought, Tony. I don't know if we can hit that one soon or not, but I'm going to add that to the list for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Um, just to quickly touch on that, don't don't get caught up on it. Like, I d- don't look at 20. Yeah. Don't look at don't look at 10. Don't look at 15. Don't just the next one. Just the next session, the next, and before you know it, you're going to have a huge campaign. It'll have 20 sessions. You'll be, you know, 20th level. No, that's a good point. That's a very good point. I don't know. Uh, what are we going to make that a topic? Yeah, it is. It's going to be a topic. I'm going to add it to the, to, the, to the list at some point here. Your turn. New new friend of the show, Sky Slayton. Dude, that name kicks ass. It totally kicks ass. He's either yeah, I, I assume he's a jet pilot. That's my assumption. This guy is a jet pilot, fighter pilot, of course, and um, is busy shooting down Nazis over the Antarctic or something. Dashing. I'm assuming this is a dashing fighter pilot. Well, then his name would be like Sky Slayer. Well, which would be also a very good Sky, name. quote unquote Slayer Slayton. See that it all goes together. Yes, That's his call sign. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, call sign Slayer. There we are. All right. Sweet. Hey, BSers. I have played, read, watched many a sci-fi story. In a month, I'll be running my first sci-fi game. It's using the newly released Esper Genesis basic rules based off 5e rules. I think the full rule books come out in December. The base setting is something like Mass Effect, uh, Space Magic, Special ancient artifacts that allow for longer and faster than normal FTL jumps. Lots of different races, etc. I will be changing some of that stuff, but my question is, do you have any resources you use specifically for sci-fi based tabletop RPGs? Thanks. Liking the show a lot so far. Working backwards. I'm on 134. Nice. So he's kind of taking a yeah. uh, inverted TARDIS effect, where he's going backwards in time through all of this. Interesting. When he has a, he's a UP, a, U, a USPS, U, UPS driver. He's one of the the folks that bring packages to people. And I imagine that he's got. I mean, you can listen to eight hours of podcasts a day. <laughs> probably, yeah. If I mean, you got he's going. probably like just. Probably devouring them. Rawr, 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 rawr. Hmm. So, Sean, you've I think you've dealt with. You're more of a sci-fi fan than I am. Have you got any thoughts for him? I don't run a ton of sci-fi. Uh, Last Parsec is pretty decent. Uh, I guess it depends on if you're just looking for info, traveler. Um, like if you're just looking for fluff ideas, uh, it depends. 
guess on your setting, you could do. You get your GURPS. You get your GURPS. You know, Star Trek. Yeah, Star Trek. If you want your kind of setting generic stuff, Traveler, I think you're dead on. When I ran Traveler for a very short campaign, it has so much really cool stuff as far as, <clears throat> even if you ignore the rules, just the backgrounds, the history, and how uh, kind of the, the Federation or whatever the hell they call it, I can't remember, how that all functions. You have ship maps, plans, kind of tech levels and stuff. And then there's a number of different GURPS books about sci-fi and so on that are kind of their splat slash sourcey books. Those types of things can be pretty handy. And you can easily ignore the rule-specific pieces and just take it for the uh, for the guts of it. Ashen Stars, if you go to like a – I think Ashen Stars is – that's Robin Laws um, out of Pelgrim Press. I don't think – is that one Gumshoe? Yeah, I think that one's Gumshoe. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> it is. So you've got that type of stuff as well. And um, if you have the system you like and you're looking for good stuff, uh, Robin Laws, I think, is a good writer, um, designs and does really uh, does some really good stuff. Look at his stuff. Mark Miller's Traveler stuff is really good. Sometimes for me, staying away from Star Trek and Star Wars because they're such big, well-known uh, IPs, sometimes it's um, I like to stay away from that just to have something a little bit different. But uh, don't be afraid to mind that shit too, man. I mean, if they've got... If there's a really cool thing about the Romulan homeworld, read it and maybe utilize that in a in a setting as well. Or same thing with um, with uh, Star Wars. You know, pick a race or a or a culture or something out of the Star Wars universe and plop it into your game as well. You could easily do that. And the th- yeah, there's White Star. Yeah, you do White Star. Uh, stars without star without stars without number. Uh, those are definitely systems, so you may end up running into kind of the same question. Um, but I'm sure sci-fi is weird because we touched on it a little bit before where it really depends on what you want to do. Like Serenity and Firefly, some would say it's kind of cowboy bebop sci-fi. Some would say it's sci-fi, period. But that's different than Star Trek sci-fi. Which is different than which is Star different. Wars sci-fi, which is different than Traveler sci-fi, which is different than transhuman sci-fi and holy shit. Or just aliens. Like aliens, the movies. Yeah. Aliens. Or, right? So you start get it's just, you know, do your, sh- you know, the space shit, is there sound in space? Is there big, you know, ship-to-ship dogfight combats? Um, heck, even The Expanse. Like, watch that show. If you really, I mean, if you're not watching The Expanse, I highly recommend it. It's a great science fiction show. The books are really good. That is very uh, Game of Thronesy because there's a lot of factions that are involved. A lot of, you know, politics. Something blew up. Somebody's framing somebody well, else. Well, look at Battlestar Galactica, so man. The re- the redo stuff. Holy shit! Go. I mean, religion aspects. <clears throat> you know. Military governments, not this. There's politics. There's, I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff. And I love mining those things. And especially sometimes if you know your players have seen it, you're like, hey, remember that scene in Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica when X happened with the captain? Oh, yeah, it's just like that, only red. Everyone goes, okay, good, I got it. And they, it's a thing that they can grok immediately. So, whew, good stuff, man. Yeah. Um, Let us know what you feel. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Sky. All right, and thanks for... Finding us and listening to Absolutely. us. Absolutely. That's awesome. All right. Let's get into the main topic, which I'm really excited I hope about. so. Oh, boy, Brett. I know. I figured you'd be up on this one. So, Chris Johnson. I am, man. I'm really <laughs> stoked about this one. Chris Johnson asked us about the West Marches style campaign. And uh, so I sent Sean a little homework ahead of time, and I said, here, Matt Colville has a great video about West Marches. We'll have a link in the show notes. It's his uh, The West Marches Running the Game number 30 in his uh, video series on that. And uh, if you like D&D, if you, and not list, or if you haven't watched Matt Colville, he's fun. He's a fast talker, right? He's got a lot of energy when you're done listening to some of his shows. Oh, my God. That, that guy is awesome. He's fun. He's a blast. And when you're done listening to him, you're like, man, I want to I wanna run some fucking D&D. I want to run some D&D right <laughs> fucking now. Who's ready to play? You know? Yeah, I get fired up listening to him. Anyway, I, 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 the first, so this video, I know Matt's pop, popped up in our stream, like, Hey, listen to this. Hey, Sean, check this out. And I've never, I've, I've, I've seen Matt. Uh, he looks like Brett. <laughs> <laughs> <And> so, 
but I've never never saw anything and never listened to any of his stuff. Didn't know. I just knew what he looked like because of his thumbnails from his videos. And then Brett's like, here, watch this for research of this show. And I'm not shitting you. I've watched that episode three times. The key is to assign um, Sean homework. He does his homework. If it's just for recreational viewing, it won't happen. Make it for, make it for a That's purpose. He'll get it done. That's true. So, Sean, I think this is uh, – I think, I think he mentioned um, – there's another gentleman. I think Ben Robbins may have been the original person who mentioned this. But um, – Anyway, so watch the video. It's a really good explanation. So the goal of the West Marches concept is called this because that's where the gentleman who started this campaign was in the the section. The West Marches was the section of the realm, the world that he was doing this in. The idea is, is that everybody has game night, or you try to. You try to get game night is like the last Saturday of every month for Brett, or it's every Wednesday for Sean, or what, every other day, or every Thursday, or whatever. And players show up because it's game night. And they sit down and say, entertain me, right? Which is – Well, they start out well, they start, off. So it's, everyone's they start fired out. up. Everyone's ready to go. But all session right. six, they're like, all right, let's see what Sean's got. What's Ange doing tonight? What are we going to react to, right? And it's not <laughs> – Sean and I tongue-in-cheek will say, got fucking players, you know. But it put the players sometimes or often do, at least in my experience. I know Sean has seen this as well. We can become passive as players waiting for the game master to tell us – what we've got, what's going to happen, so that when we're reacting to stuff, we're not being very proactive about it. And we talked about this a little bit, which is one of the things I'm hip about with like Invisible Sun and so forth. They're supposed to be the game is supposed to be designed to have a lot of player engagement and so on. But this is a concept of helping the players to become less passive and more proactive in how it goes about this to stop the staleness and also to deal with large groups or potential large groups where you have a number of people who love to play, but not maybe not everybody can make it all the time. Maybe you have 12 players who'd like to play, but they can't all show up. And for God's sakes, you might not want to run a 12, <laughs> a 12-person session. You might want to run a five- or six-person session. Maybe three is your right number. So one of the, um, the, the other main component of this is this is about exploration, Pretty much a sandbox style approach where you say, hey, here's a thing, here's a place, and here's some stuff. What do you want to do? So, Sean, I'm going to go through the my little bullet points here, and uh, you stomp on me where I missed something. Sound good? Yeah, sure, right. man. So, again, it's about exploration, and the idea is there's no game night. There's no set night. You don't say, hey, it's every Thursday, it's every Wednesday. <laughs> it's Everything is done on an adventure-by-adventure adventure basis. Where the players in a community, if say you've got a group of 10 guys and gals who all want to play, and Ange says, hey, one of the things out there is the ancient dwarven mines of Cragdor. Sean, um, you know, Brandon and uh, Kev all want to go with me to the ancient dwarven mines of Cragdor. Brett, we're going to the dwarven mines of Cragdor. We can show up. We've got this Saturday free. Are you good? Yeah, I can run Saturday. Good. We're going to the mines of Cragdor on Saturday. Sounds good. And then I show up prepared to run the Mines of Cragdor on Saturday for that group. When they're done with it, <clears throat> so the players have negotiated with the Game Master. They've negotiated with each other as to who, whose characters that they're bringing on this adventure and what will happen and their approach and all that good stuff. And once it's done, all the notes and so on and so forth that they have from that session are then shared with everybody. So social media is great for this, obviously, to get a community going, whatever. So that group of people... I'm done running. They take all the information they have, and they produce all the notes saying, hey, everyone else in that group, the other five or six of, you, of the total crew that could have played but you know, didn't want to go to the Dwarven Mines of Cragdor, we found X, Y, and Z. We had this problem. Hey, here's the map sketch we drew. Here's this. Here's this. Here's this. Here's what we've learned about this section of the world. Great. The next player group is led by you know Phil, and Phil has decided that he wants to go um, to the Lost Mines of whatever – and he's pulled in three other people. And they can only make it in two weeks on a Thursday. So we negotiate, we figure out the best day, boom, we have that adventure. And it kind of goes and goes and goes in that type of thing. It's a single world, single setting, single campaign. But the idea is multiple players, possible. Hell, you could even have multiple gems in this setting if you wanted to. But the idea is the players are the ones who are choosing where to go and who's going to go and when. Right. 
So um, I think that's kind of the, the basic um, thrust of all of it. Sean, did you pull anything else out that I missed from uh, from that perspective? Uh, no. So it's always sharing. It's, it's yes, you're, you're right. Scheduling, right, yes. It's also – where the what one thing I found was interesting was you know treasure map piece of it. So you draw the map, or one of the things that Matt brought up was Ben Robbins, who is kind of the one that came up with this concept. Also did two books, which is the Kingdom and Correct. Microscope. And Microscope, you build a you build a ancient. Um, uh, civilization, and then kingdom you build, obviously, like a small town, small city, what have you. And it's, and both have different mechanics um, in a different angle. But the reason I bring that up is because one of the things you may do as a game master to kick this off is just provide a treasure map and you give it to the players. And then they are to go out and venture and kind of say, right, like Brett said, we're going to go to here. We're going to go to these ruins. But the treasure map doesn't have to be accurate. Absolutely not. He, he uses specifically Thorn Orkenshield's map from The Hobbit, right? It's not to scale. It's right. got notes written on it. It says, hey, there's a dragon here. Mirkwood's over there. It's clearly not to fucking scale. There's no hexes. There's nothing. You have no fucking clue unless you can physically see the mountain from the home base you start in. You don't know if the mountain is 10 days ride, 5 days walking. I have no clue. You don't know. You haven't been there. Right. So... So part of it is like when's the last time a group has has gotten lost genuinely. So that's that component and then yeah, as time goes on, I don't know if I don't know if I caught this when you were talking Brett about changing the group. Mhm. Right? The group the group changes. Did you No, say I that? didn't. And that that's kind of one of the other pieces, right? Is that so Ange led the charge to get the the party together to go to Cragdoor the ancient Dwarven ruins, because that's the thing she wanted to do, and she found like-minded adventurers who wanted to go with her. And they're working out of, you know, you know, Gamey and Biesten, where the, uh, you know, where, where it's just your safe home. And the safe home tends to be the safe place where you always go, and that's kind of where the adventuring party is. But then, after she's done with that, and she says, hey, okay, the next thing I was really interested in was looking for um, this other quest thing, or there's supposed to be a lost artifact on this treasure map on this kind of blank canvas that we've been given i want to go there if nobody who went to Cragdoor wants to do that it's then incumbent on an Ange to find somebody else who wants to go look for the next dwarven amulet that she wants to collect she can't find anybody who wants to do it but she finds sean and sean says you know what i'll do that for you but what i need you to do is help me rally some troops because i want to go to the dark forest because in the dark forest is supposed to be the whispering tree. Once I find the whispering tree, I think there's some really cool stuff there. We're going to be able to find out because it was on this other adventure and the clues are pointing at this whispering tree. I need, I, I want to go there. Can you help me do that? And says, fine. I hope you kind of crowdsource a group of five of us to go to the whispering tree. Once we're done with that, I at least have you hooked up to go to look for the elven am- or excuse me, the dwarven amulet. So that type of thing is happening. And as that's going on, it's all out in the open. The group is discussing it. And uh, if they're updating the map communally or whatever it is that they're doing to make sure all the notes are out there in the open so everybody sees it and knows what's going down. And um, every time they say, okay, we're ready to go to the Whispering Tree, so, says Brett running the game, looks like I need to prepare the Whispering Tree adventure. So I get that ready. I don't have to have the entire campaign planned out from beginning to end, which is kind of what... We are talking about a little bit at the beginning here with some of the uh, listener feedback. I prep the campaign adventure by adventure based on how the characters want to go about it, how the players want to go get it, which is really, really cool. I love the idea of the characters swapping or changing things out like that. Well, right, and he even mentions that if you've adventured with the same people more than twice, you're not allowed to. Yeah, that was an idea that they had to try to make twice. it so you didn't get these clicks within the game, right? So you got... Right, because then you're running three different groups. Which is, defeats the fucking purpose which, of having... Which defeats what you're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. So if you've got ten men and women who want to play, you shouldn't be two groups of five in a shared note scenario. It should be everybody's intermingling because we all want to play together, right? 
Well, it ends up where Brett and Zave and Alpha all know each other. They feel comfortable with the, each other. So every time they want to adventure, it's they're picking each, picking each yeah. other. And they're you know they may still be sharing the info, and you know then it becomes maybe competitive, which it shouldn't be. Uh, and then they don't you know so then you're again goes to oh now this week is Zave and Brett and Alpha it's game, and then you know Monday night is you know uh, Eileen's and Angela's and Hobbs's yep. night. Right, and then it doesn't make sense. So if you stop that and make it like, hey, you can't adventure with like more than two of the same people twice and within two weeks, then you start mixing those up. And then he even mentioned where you might feed somebody a rumor that has something to do with somebody else. Yeah, then you've got. I, I know right, all mentioned. about you know Hobbs's character's background potentially because or a a thing that could have to do with him. Like, oh, you made a you made an enemy of an assassin who lives in. The Dark Forest by the Whispering Tree. Fuck, I gotta go deal with this goddamn assassin. He wants my ass or whatever. You could drag him in. One of the things he didn't mention that I thought of as you were, as you were, we were just talking through this is one way to potentially help that would be no more than two players of <clears throat> any class. Right? I don't need five fighters, six clerics, and four mages, right? So no more than two of any general kind. So there's two fighters. Well, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna end up having to use the you're gonna need a fighter in a D and D type of scenario. If you have got a class type scenario, I'm using D and D as a classic example because again, that's what um, Colville is talking about uh, ninety times out of hundred. But I, I need a fighter. I could really use a thief in this adventure, and we probably should have a cleric with us. Well, if you only have one cleric, that one cleric gets the lucky draw and he or she's always in every adventure is always in heavy need but if you try to get two of every class or two of every major skill set you can start to split things up when somebody isn't available somebody else can cover that niche uh for the for whatever adventuring party is getting together that for that adventure i think that would be helpful yeah and there was talks about um i mean i think he mentioned ben in his game that he ran was he would tell the AC and the hit points of the monsters. Yeah, he was really, I mean, totally rolling all dice in front of the characters. It was, this was an idea, all dice in front of the players. Um, this is a dragon. It has 150 hit points. It has an armor class of 30. You know, it doesn't have all, you, he would yeah, give advice. Give advice. You sure you want to go that way? You're going to have to, you're going to have to face this. Oh, that's yeah. right. Then it became, it fostered a us against the world versus us against the yes master. which i thought was interesting i try i heard that and i thought you know i actually do that in a way naturally just to i you know give little hints or advice to the players in game was saying hey well now remember your dwarf would know that if you went here you're gonna have to fight the great two-headed ogre of slanesh oh fuck i don't want to deal with the two-headed ogre of slanesh the thing's been ruling that valley for the last 50 years i don't want to deal with that um, but I think this is even being even more meta than, uh, than that, but you don't have to necessarily be meta, but the idea is to share more information and, um, let the players know that they're working in this collaborative environment that, Hey, the game master as well is collaborating with us as we're pulling all this stuff together. Right. Yes. So what do you, I mean, it sounds really, really, it sounds cool to me and I don't, I think it's I think it's awesome. I want to run this shit. I really do. The only problem is I can't just be, you know, hey, we got a group together. Can you play Saturday? Hey, we got a group together. Can you play Thursday? Yeah, it, it you've got to have more lead. Too we, sporadic. It's lead time, right? Saying, hey, I'm we're booking games for November. Who wants the game in November? And you don't you don't have to be well, just like whenever. You could set time aside saying, Hey look, I'm the game master, my name's Sean, and I have these six days open in November to run. If anybody wants to run, they're filling up. Right, I could do mm -hmm. that. And I have so for my job, I'm one of the smarter recruiters in town. I do actually self scheduling. I'm humble. Yeah, too. I, was good. I do self scheduling. Which is well, some recruiters. So, anyways, it's important for me to talk to um, people, 
And part of that is I could send out a time and say, hey, Brett, do you have Thursday at 9 o'clock? And Brett goes, no, I can't do 9 o'clock. And I go, okay, can you do 10 o'clock? And I'm like, nope, Thursday's bad for me. So instead, I just send Brett a link and say, here are the five openings I have. Pick one. And if none of those five work, then then email me and let me know, and I will I will set aside a slot. Um, and that that will work. So I'm thinking going to the scheduling piece is I do. There's software out there that you can get. You can book me is one place. I'll put a link in the show notes. I gotta write that down. There's other ones too. I think Calendly Calendly is another one, but you. Book you can book me free, and then what you do is you can set up your calendar, and just keep the open. You could use a like, Google okay. Calendar for kind of a lot actually, and just put in like open game night. Oh. You could use a Google Calendar, share it out, and say these are the days I have open. What do you mean? What do you Doesn't mean? Work. No. Yes, you can. Well, well, the the problem with Google Calendar is you don't have. Yes, you can see like here's what Sean's blocked. But that doesn't tell me if it's booked. Oh, I get it. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Like, like is if somebody says, hey, I want to all schedule things on Saturday, it'll remove it off the availability list. The problem with that is that I think it does it for a one-for-one. One. I don't think it does it for, like, a group. But if you if, but somebody like if you just had one contact person do it, then great. Yeah, if a person who wants to go to the Dwarven Minds of Cragdoor says, hey, um, <clears throat> and is building the group, and she says, because the group is, I mean, the the important piece of all this is that the players are crowdsourcing it themselves. They're working together. They're helping to build it and um, calendaring and scheduling and all this stuff. If this adventure is important to Ange, you know, she gets to say, hey, I really want to do this in November. Um, I, I'm, you know, however she comes up with it or whatever, or whatever, she could be the single point of contact for the group and says, look, we're all available these three days. Sean, are you good here, here, or here? I mean, there's there's ways to do this. And I think there's plenty of different free apps and different um, calendar tools, as you said, to, to help us help us schedule this stuff better. So I think that would be a big that'd be a big help. Yeah. And if you had group I think it I don't know. I, I was stoked about when I heard this, I'm like Yes, yes, I could do that. I could prep for somebody that wants to go to the ruins off this forest, mm-hmm. create three to six encounters, have them do their thing, go back to town, maybe not go back to town, next session, somebody finds out they went, they never returned, you know, whatever, whatever the word is from the last town. hmm whether you have bounties set up, whatever it is, I'm like, I I could run this shit, man. The other thing that you can do too <clears throat> with this is because, yeah. You know, so you don't correct the map. So if the players are creating a map of the environment or the map you gave them, they're marking it up, or you don't ever give them an official map of the environment and it let it be communal, let all the information be shared, right? So they can learn and grow and do whatever. And if they've put down contradictory stuff, Hey, guess what? That's just how this fucking works. There's, it's not the computer age. Um, it's just, it's, you know, your fantasy setting, but the other component of it is it's about, excuse me, exploration and adventures. So it's about going to places and looking for stuff, going out from a place to another place. So if you wanted to have, um, if you wanted to get trickier with it and say, well, it's going to be a big city-based adventure, similar type of approach, um, probably have to do a bit more work. Really, to make that function, you need like a massive city like my, my home world of Avalon that I've made, where it would have enough space where you could go and have people go like to the far north end or far to the west, east, or south, where they could get lost or get spend days away from the home area where they could then come back and report or whatever the case is. But the general approach of it is that it's exploration type of adventures. Even if you're going from planet to planet, right? You're mapping out a star system. You're doing something when you're out there going forth to, um, to get this stuff. And I, and you can, he calls this out is that you can do multiple game masters, which I think is actually kind of cool as well. Cause if you have two people who want to, run in the same world or that you, you, you can game master back and forth together. Like, Hey, Sean wants to run, but he'd like to play as well. And Eileen's like, well, I can run great. So she can run for when Sean wants to play or whatever. So 
I don't think you need a larger group as well. Uh, Matt Colville had talked about, you know, maybe even having up to only eight players total, right? So taking, like, Brett's usual group size and saying, hey, instead of trying to schedule all eight of us to get one place at one time, how about three or four of us get together at any one time? Who can be there? What's the, what's the adventure for that evening? If it's a continuation of the last adventure, great. Just make sure the same players show up and you guys schedule that and then I'll get ready for the next session or whatever. It's it's a really tempting it's a yeah, super man. tempting layout. Dude, I'm running this shit. Who wants in? <laughs> Who wants in, man? I, I could take uh I could put maybe ten people. I'll take ten well, people. Well the cool part too is that you could do this in a mixture of online and in person, right? So if you wow. I'm, I'm seriously though, if you lived in if you lived in town with well, a group of true. people, you're like, yeah, look, but, there's five of us yeah. that live right here. We can all come to Sean's house and play. Great. Oh, the next time half of that group, say two people out of that five person group, wants to play with, you know, Ange and Steve, and they're both remote, that's okay. That adventure takes place on Roll20. You can hop from format to format when it comes to running stuff. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So it's not sure. like you're tied down to, oh, that has to be all online or has to be whatever. So I think the overall approach, I mean, the overall theory behind it is to try to make it as free of an environment as possible from the nightmare scheduling, get the players engaged so that they want to be there. They're showing up to go to the Mountains of Cragder, to go to the, you know, the Lost Mines on planet whatever, um, or they want to go see the Whispering Pine, and they want to go there. They're there not because the Game Master said tonight's adventure is about the Whispering Pine in the Dark Forest. Oh, sure, I guess my dwarf will go to the fucking forest. This way, when someone goes, hey, I want to go there, you know, Eileen says, my dwarf doesn't give a fuck about the forest. I'm going after the crown. Um, Good luck, guys, you know. And then all the, the druids, rangers, and elves all trot off into the forest, and everybody else goes and lays, and lays siege to the, uh, to the orcs that have caused a problem in the north. So <laughs> you don't have to have – nobody is forced on an adventure they don't want to be on. Right. You have that level right. of engagement is the idea. And which we didn't touch on, there was talk about scaling. So the f- closer you are to kind of your town, the, the less craziness it is. And then the further you go out, the higher level risk. Yeah. Right. And legitimately higher level encounters. Yeah, it's zones, right? It's like a bullseye type of thing. You've got the concentric, yes. not concentric, well, uh, concentric rings or whatever you want to say, kind of rippling out. <sighs> the idea was the center component of it is 90 times out of 100 safe. Maybe at some point the home base becomes something you can fuck with people at home, but usually it's the safest place is where the adventures come together. If you think um, um, old school Bard's Tale and some of those old uh, PC or. Apple IIe Adventures, where you went to the inn, talked to the adventurers, you grabbed three new party members in, and you went out, right, where characters were stored. It's a similar type of approach, right, where you come in, you pick the adventurers you need, and then you go out of town. That section is safe. And then the farther out you go, the uglier and nastier it is, because this exploration is wilder and crazier. Um, the, the na- Well, and ide- ideally... Ideally, you would do the quick little hits that are closer by that aren't major, or maybe you got lost and you're encountering goblins or kobolds, where the further you get out, you're messing with heavier, heavier stuff. Yeah, I mean, if the first thing you're dealing right. with are, so you're leveling. yeah, you're leveling up and moving through, there's maybe maybe an ogre running a group of goblins at one point, and then eventually you're dealing with an entire hobgoblin army. That's marching out of the mountains to try to lay waste to this halfling village you've discovered or something along those lines. So I don't think it has to be only fantasy based. I mean, we're, we tend to, Sean and I, we love fantasy, so we tend to use D&D as a common ground. But as I say, you could do this with a sci fi thing. I mean, what uh, Sky's talking about with a sci fi environment, you could do a similar type of thing. As long as you're having people go out to um, other places. Right, and if they're only going to adventure within a certain location, then you need to make sure that location's big enough so that they can spread out. Well, and he mentioned he mentioned that, or that he referred to Ben and said that Ben didn't allow any adventure in town. Yeah, he said that you know, yeah, there's there never was, adventure no, in town. Nothing was going to happen there. Nothing's going to happen in town. There's no reason to sit around, like because nobody's going to. 
Like it's a town and you're not doing anything. Like you got to go out to to do to get a flavor stuff. texty thing that he had too was that at, in town at this inn was a big oaken table. And the adventurers would go out, who would come back and they would draw the map. They'd carve the map on top of this big oak table of what they had seen, a previous group of adventurers. So then there was a fire at one point, the inn burned, and this is all that's left of the table, i.e. the treasure map or quote-unquote adventure map that the characters, all the players have access to, was this beaten, burned, and slashed up table that said, hey, here's stuff you could go find. Um, this other previous group of adventurers had gone out and done this stuff, and then they'd mapped it out. Now, again, it's an adventurer's map. There's no fucking cartography. There's no hexes. There's no any of that stuff. It's just like... I don't know how far it is from here to the pines. I don't know how far it is from here to the river, but somewhere down by the river is a sunken gold mine, and that's where we want to go to. So you head off in that general direction. And then the idea is, again, everybody's communally updating each other. And then he would do things like, um, or I think Matt was talking about this too. I I forget if it was Ben doing it or Matt talking about doing it. Anyway, um, rewarding the players who are sharing the most, right? So you've got somebody who takes all the notes for the session, and publishes that stuff up to help encourage. It's almost like a, a tip from the Amber uh, Dices RPG that if you take the time to put the energy in as a player to say, hey, here's all the notes from the last session. Here's our updated map. Here's this. Here's that. You get a thing, like a, a fate point, an, an inspiration, a Benny, something, so that the next session, whatever you go into, you have that extra power of some kind as a, bo- as a bonus because you put the time in to help collaborate with the rest of the players. Which is another cool thing to do. Helps get people kind of plugged in and wanting to do it. I think it's right. cool. And I think it takes... I think that... You really want to do this, man? You're going to do it? All yeah. right. So anybody, anyone listening to us can play with Sean. You take like 30, 40 people. <laughs> Holy shit. I, the, problem, the problem with that... So the problems with it is... Um, so say I said 20 people, 20 people, um, and we'll run, you know, then it's the frequency part. So then what happens is say, if I break it down and I run five people at a time, six people, maybe max, then what happens depending on, I guess it depends on the, the frequency expectations of some of the players. So I may get a player that's like, awesome, I'm in, but I can only play once a month. Right? Perfect. Not a big deal. The problem is, is you get the person that wants to play all and the Sean time. And Sean can't run that many games. And, <laughs> and you got it right. And I can't run that many games. And I got to rotate different players in, right? Kind of thing. That may be a problem. But I could see having at least eight people in I this. I think, honestly, if you start with eight, to- you'd be eight to ten. Ten maybe on the outside. But if you started with eight, you could give it. A, you could get a good taste and see if it works, right? Start small before you go right, too big. Right, and then scale. Right. Sure. So, I mean, I already know I already know one, two, potentially three people that would be interested. I'm interested. That messaged me yeah. off my last I'm, time. Well, I don't care. All right, you. fine. Okay, Frick. that's fine. Fine. <laughs> all right, so Brett. I got so – I got – Say yeah. Brett. Can I get somebody to balance that out? Can I get a good player in here? <laughs> Give me so, somebody who knows what they're doing. Can somebody else please? Now, now maybe nobody will volunteer. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, Brett's in. Can I have enough people that I could tell Brett I'm sorry I'm full? Can someone please <laughs> sign up so I can tell I'm full? <laughs> so, oh, you know what happened, Brett? In that th- like two seconds, I had like 20 people. Yeah, and you've you already me. played with me. I just figured yeah, I just, I'd, yeah. That's all that guy. Right, yeah. I th- I, well, I just probably wouldn't. T- I wouldn't tell you. I would just not tell you. Yeah, yeah. So you would bring it up on the show. I'd be like, "Hey, Sean, did you ever start that West Marshes game?" I'm like, "No, man, she yeah. can't." <laughs> Until I see all the Until I see yeah, all I the feedback that rolls in about how it's going. Like, motherfucker. <laughs> I'll tell you though, I think it's a really good idea. And uh, even if I couldn't make it, I, it, I'd still be very interested. And the other piece, of course, is is anybody out there doing this, or any variations of it, right? <clears throat> because no matter what. Ben Robbins does a thing. He goes, "Hey, this works really well. Other people might like this and try it. We're gamers, so we're gonna we're gonna hack the rules. We're gonna make it our own. We're gonna do something different." And um, I'm wondering if anybody else is at all interested in this thing. If they are, what they think of it. If they somebody thinks it's a dumb fucking idea, why? And if anybody is actually doing it, 
or knows of anyone who's doing it, it would be interesting to uh, see it in action or hear from somebody who's actually doing it. As Coville said, he's not done it. He's interested in doing it um, and just kind of laid it out. So in the same vein, Sean, I think it's cool. It sounds like a really neat idea. I'm uh, very interested and I'm sure Sean is too to see who's doing it, if anybody else is. It'd be neat to see. Yeah. I really want to find out if anybody's done this. And, and frankly... If they've done it and went, oh, you know, one of the things I ran into is this. So just a heads yeah, oh up. Oh, God, don't use like You may want yeah, to be conscious. Don't use this tool. That's, that one sucks. Use this other one. It's the only way to go. Right, or whatever. Like, whatever. whenever you set something up, make sure you absolutely make it clear this, X, Y, whatever. <laughs> we would like to learn, yeah, we'd like stuck, to learn from man. other people's mistakes so we don't fuck I, up in the exact same way. I, I figure I'd start breaking out the rule cyclopedia, man, and just say, hey, do do that era, but I, you know, I don't know. I could probably do five. Oh, easily could do five E. That's the other thing to do too. Is you say, do I f- mean, you say, look, I want to run D and D. Um, this rule set, West March's style. Who's in? You know, forty six. Drop the drop the lowest. 40s. Right down there the line. Right down the line, man. <laughs> I like it. That's character Done, Jen, on. right now. Just put it out there. House rule. House rule. 46 in order. That way you pick whatever class it is after well, the There fact. you go. And you can have multiple characters. That's true. You could. Which is actually, that, that's actually that a thing we didn't, what, he didn't mention, call. but you throwing it out there right now is if you only, quote unquote, only had five people who wanted to play, and now that five's bad. But if they had different characters, and you could run a and you design sessions that could be run for like three people. If only three people can make it, you can still run a damn good game session with only three players. You know, you don't need all five. Now, Grant, eight seems like the right number. Well, I, I, I think it would behoove them to be more to have than some three. extra meat. We need some meat shields. Need a hit point buffer. I'm, need something. Hey, if they think they can go out into the wilderness with three people. It's a dangerous world yeah, out there, bro. <laughs> Whatever. I am I am merely game master. Yes. I would be impartial as shit. Be like, okay, sounds good. So let's begin. You die. What? Your kids die. What? Your dog's dead. <laughs> what the fuck happened? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, the West Marsh I can't I gotta call it the East Marsh. Yeah, marshes. gotta change it up a little bit. Keep people guessing. East Marsh. Marshes. Not the mark. Yeah, put it in a swamp. That would be good. (laughs) Well, well, cool. Let us know what you think, folks. I mean, it it sounds this sounds super sexy. I think this would be. I think this has got some legs. It can go places. So let's uh, let's see if anybody's doing it and uh, what it would take to make it happen. Fantastic. Shall we move on? All right. Let's get it. Let's get in a die roll. All right, die roll. Hey, so the only one I had was I threw out there um, was my Warhammer campaign. I'm going to have a G plus community. If anybody's interested in it, let me know. I didn't want to spam the community or patrons with it. Um, if you are interested, let me know. I will add you to the community. And um, I've got just ran my big kickoff session. So I'm going to go through within the next week or so and uh, punch through all the different notes and such of what happened. I will not have any of my players in this group, so it will be more of a behind-the-scenes component. Players will get their own version of notes, but I'll um, spill some other secret stuff in this space, so that will be the goal. If you're interested, let me know, and I'll get you hooked up. All right. Jason Hobbs Hobbs runs for Gauntlet Con online. If you want to view his Olive game on the YouTubes, I'll have a link to his game. You can watch Hobbs in action. I call it the Olive Game. You know the reference, Brett? No, I'm kind of scared to ask you. Because he calls it, because he's called it Kalamata. Oh, Kalamata. Oh, yeah. So you're thinking, yes. All right. Kalamata. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm sure he's going <laughs> to love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure he will as well. <laughs> Friend for life, you've made there. Next one. Next one, why West March's campaign needs a town by Tavis Allison. So kind of tying into the theme of the evening, uh, check out that article. Uh, ben Robbins, who is the grandfather of the West March's principal uh, idea, 
He we've got links to Wes March's idea where it kind of stemmed and his his take on why he wanted to start it. And then also links to Microscope, which is an affiliate link to Drive Through RPG. So and then Kingdom. So Matt Colville was talking about using those two games to kind of set the ancient civilization, mm-hmm. kind of for people to go and explore, and then Kingdom to kind of set up the town and some of the roles that the players may take upon themselves. So he was kind of like probably one to two hours each, and then you kind of run the game from there. But there's a couple of those if you want to look into some of Ben's works. Uh, yeah, we're going to do the first one for listeners. Sure thing, Charles Whitelist, know about uh, Monster Hunters Club Kickstarter for Savage Worlds RPG. A book designed to immerse you in a world inspired by 80s kids, adventure and horror films, television, and novels. Starting like E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Goonies, Monster Squad, Lost Boys, Fright Night, It, Super 8, Stranger Things, of course, and many more. So take a look at that. Tales from the Loop folks or fans who uh, may be looking at that saying, boy, if I got Tales from the Loop, I would want to change it to Savage Worlds. Click. Someone's doing the work for you right now. Might be worth a look. There you go. Yeah, and speaking of which, Stranger Things coming up this week. I, yeah, I still haven't week. seen the first season. I should watch that. It's supposed to be very good. I don't watch a lot of TV. I'm too busy running games, Sean. Don't have time for TV. So dis- oh, 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 <laughs> all, right. all right. Fair enough. Uh, Edwin Nagy. Nagy. He's going to be a game hole con, but he wanted to. he's involved with the Frog God Games guys for Extra Life event. So we'll have a link to their... 24-hour gaming extravaganza that he's helping out head head up. Very cool. Yeah. And Kevin Lovecraft has Roll for Your Party. It's an excellent web-based dice rolling app you can pair with G Plus Hangouts if you if you prefer not to use Roll Twenty. It supports trad dice as well as fudge, DCC dice. Click the funky dice selector, of course, and cards. So check that out. Very cool. Thanks. Good good find, Kev. We have to give it a shot when we start playing a little Dresden Fate with the boys. Right. Uh, what are we talking about next week, Brett? Uh, Michael Parker talked about play by post, and in the spirit of kind of different campaigns <coughs> and doing things a little bit differently, this West Marches piece, I felt uh, talking about play by post might be uh, a good uh, follow on topic. So we'll hit that and see where it goes. Sweet. Very sweet indeed. Well. This has been an episode of Gaming and BS that has been brought to you with the help from the following patrons. Christian Sexy Voice Serrano, Kevin Lovecraft, Joe Swick, Brett's Biggest Fan, Jeff Rodham, Acker Forrest, Tegary, Mark Anthony, Benedict Denny, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Sean Nicholson, Tim Jensen, Knights of the Night Crew, Palladian, Remy Bellado, Jason Hobbs, Hobbs, Wayne Humphrey, James Carpio, not Caprio, Pure Mongrel, Lord Tentacle, Corey Johnson, Brandon Barnes, Tim Shorts, Dan LaValley, C.W. Mellencamp, the Lost Sailor, Graham Miner, Tom McGowan, Roger Brasslett, Misdirected Mark Productions, Old School DM, Jason, Christopher Gray, Finn Elf, Merkel Froilich, Eileen Barnes, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, Todd Crapper, Jim Fitzpatrick, Michael Drescher, with Static, Alexander Auerbach, Rodrigo Beowulf, Neil Benson, Ron Blessing, Chris Steele, Eric the Hoff Hoffman, Soldiers of Misfortune, RPG, Christopher Lang, Curtis Takahashi, Gordon Cranford, Mark Saka, Larry Hout, Evan Harrison Cass, Ray Otis, Mark CMG Clover, Eli Kurtz, Ron Bishop, Stephen Dragonspawn, Craig Huber, Xavier G, J V, Mark Stark, John Hammersley, Derelict Radio, John, Steve, Jared Rasher, and Mark Richman. For the cost of a coffee shop coffee, you can support the entire show for the entire month. Consider heading over to gaming and BS forward slash whoa, gaming and forward slash Patreon. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thank you, patrons, friends. Thank you, listeners. I am one of your hosts, Sean. I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. This This has has been been a Litterbox Studio production. production.